Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton faced off in their final debate. Did either of them attract new voters? CNBC contributor Larry Kudlow will handicap it all for us. And later, we'll get story-ended and talk the fundamental bonds between fathers and sons with children's author Avi. And finally, a look at an inspiring new film, Queen of Katwe, with one of its stars, David Oyelowo. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over from EWTN Studios in Orange County, California. Larry Kudlow, Avi, and David Oyelowo are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show or if you have a question, I'll be live tweeting throughout. You can find me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. Republican Donald Trump faced off against Democratic rival Hillary Clinton in a combative but substantive third and final presidential debate in Las Vegas on Wednesday. They discussed their views on abortion, gun rights, immigration, taxes, the economy, ISIS, Iran, and Syria. One new controversy has emerged, whether the election is rigged, reviving the successful argument he made about both the Republican and Democratic primaries. Trump had spent the days leading up to the debate warning voters that the general election could be rigged. At the debate, moderator Chris Wallace asked whether he would accept the election outcome if Clinton emerges as the victor. Trump said he would look at it at the time, that is, after the election. The two candidates also clashed over Russian President Vladimir Putin and the country's purported hacking of Clinton's related emails. Here's a bit of that exchange. Putin, wait, wait, from but, everything I see, has no respect for this person. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's pretty clear you won't admit no, that the, the Russians have engaged in cyber attacks against the United States of America, that you encouraged espionage against our people, that you are willing to spout the Putin line because he has a very clear favorite in this race. Second, she Mr. doesn't Mr. like Mr. Putin because Putin Mr. has outsmarted her at every Mr. step Trump, of the way. I Trump entered the debate trailing in most polls by as many as 10 points in some. Not since Ronald Reagan has a candidate recovered from a deficit this deep and this late in the race. More on the final debate and the final two weeks of this historic presidential election in our next segment. And rigged election or no, undercover video released this week of purported voter fraud and the inciting of violence at political rallies by Democratic operatives is creating new headaches for Hillary Clinton. Political activist James O'Keefe procured the video through his group Project Veritas. The central character in the recordings is Scott Fulville. In one video, he says how it would be easier to get away with voter fraud if out-of-state residents drive to the polls in the targeted states rather than being bussed in there by an organizer. So you can't prove that it's en masse, he said. So it doesn't tip people off. In another video, Fovel brags about deploying troublemakers at Trump rallies. He further boasts about his connections to the Clinton campaign and the Democratic Party. He claims that he got mentally ill people to incite violence at Trump rallies. You can message to draw them out and draw them out to punch you, Fobel says in the video. In July, the Democratic National Committee paid $26,000 to a consulting group called Mobilize to stage Democratic events at Trump rallies. Hillary Clinton did not comment on the controversy when it was brought up during the debate. Afterwards, she told reporters... She knew nothing about it. And according to FBI files made public Monday, a senior State Department official asked the FBI last year to help alter the classification of email from Hillary Clinton's private server. 
It was to be part of a bargain that would have allowed the FBI to deploy more agents in foreign countries. Bureau records indicate that State Department Undersecretary Patrick Kennedy sought a, quote, quid pro quo. In exchange for the declassification, the FBI would be given desirable overseas deployments. The FBI ultimately rejected the idea, which would have allowed the State Department to archive a message related to the Benghazi attack. And according to the FBI files, it would never be seen again. Wednesday's presidential debate was not the last election season stage that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump appeared on together. They were featured at the 71st annual Al Smith Dinner in Manhattan on Thursday. The annual charitable gala held at the Waldorf Astoria each year was hosted by the Archdiocese of New York and Cardinal Timothy Dolan. Some Catholics have objected to the cardinal inviting a candidate who opposes church teaching on issues ranging from abortion to marriage. Now, some of Dolan's predecessors refused to invite candidates to the dinner who advocated positions at odds with church teaching. Still, both Trump and Clinton appeared at the dinner. Before the gathering, Cardinal Dolan weighed in on the leaked remarks by members of Clinton's campaign staff mocking Catholics and Catholicism. Extraordinarily patronizing and insulting to Catholics. If it had been said about the Jewish community, if it had been said about the Islamic community, within 10 minutes there would have been an apology and a complete distancing from those remarks. Hasn't happened yet. I'm hoping that she's going to distance herself from these very insulting remarks of her, of her chief of staff. The Clinton campaign has yet to issue a retraction for those statements. And the battle to liberate Mosul is underway. An air and ground offensive was launched against ISIS this week in the largest military operation there since the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Christian militias and Peshmerga forces backed by the U.S. have joined Iraqi troops in the effort to retake the city once considered the heartland of Iraq's Christian population. Mosul was overrun by the Islamic State forces in 2014. It remains the last ISIS stronghold in Iraq. One million civilians are trapped there. Iraq officials estimate it could take two months to liberate Mosul. Here's some good news. Near Mosul, Christians are rejoicing after the liberation of Qara Qush, once a city of 50,000. It is home to 10 Syriac Catholic and Orthodox churches. And there was rejoicing in Nigeria on Sunday for 21 families of those schoolgirls kidnapped two and a half years ago by Boko Haram militants. The girls were reunited with their parents. They were released on Thursday last week after a negotiated release between the government and Boko Haram. On Wednesday, Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari met with the girls and their families. He promised to continue his efforts to secure the release of some 200 women still missing. Who is the well, join the appeal to rejoice and pray the Almighty. We shall redouble efforts to ensure that we fulfill our pledge of bringing the remaining girls back home. According to the reports, more than 100 of the women appear unwilling to leave their jihadist captors. They were likely radicalized or forced to marry and have children while in custody. Another prelate from Latin America has made church history. Father Arturo Sosa of Venezuela became the 31st Superior General of the Society of Jesus this week. He is the first Jesuit leader not to hail from Europe, dating back to the order's 16th century founder, St. Ignatius of Loyola. The newly elected superior general says the top priority for Jesuits is to work for reconciliation in the world. Sosa, who has, was well known to Jesuit Jorge Bergoglio, now Pope Francis, stressed that at the heart of the Jesuits' mission is their link to the papacy and their willingness to obey him in choosing the priorities of their mission. He also said Christians should heed Pope Francis's message about caring for the environment and reconciling with creation because, quote, we are so wounded that we even put the planet Earth at risk. And finally, the Vatican is renting out some of its prime Roman real estate 
to American fast food giant McDonald's. But some of the church's top cardinals are, well, not loving it. Italian Cardinal Elio Scriccia was the first to object to McDonald's moving into the Vatican-owned building. He called it a controversial, perverse decision, not respectful of the architectural and urban traditions in Rome. In La Repubblica, he also objected to McDonald's burgers and fries, saying they were unacceptable cuisine and breached Italian taste. The battle to stop McDonald's has now reached the upper echelons of the church. According to reports, several cardinals who live upstairs from the potential McDonald's went so far as to write a letter of protest to the Pope himself. Assuming the Pope doesn't intervene, they'll be ordering Big Macs with extra formaggio any day now. Be sure to stay tuned. To the end of this show, I have a very special announcement. A big interview coming up next week, but I'm not telling you yet. When we return, the presidential debates have come to an end, and Election Day is approaching. How do the candidates look going into this final stretch? We'll discuss it all with Larry Kudlow when The World Over Live continues. Stay right here. do have experience. I say the one thing you have over me is experience, but it's bad experience because what you've done has turned out badly. If you become president, this country is going to be in some mess, believe me. He raised the 30 years of experience. So let me just talk briefly about that. In the 1980s, I was working to reform the schools in Arkansas. He was borrowing $14 million from his father to start his businesses. Give me and a on the day when I was in the Situation Room, monitoring the raid that brought Osama bin Laden to justice. He was hosting The Celebrity Apprentice. Those were the presidential candidates, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, during last night's final presidential debate. How did they do? And what should the candidates focus on as they head to the final weeks before Election Day? Joining us to analyze the debate and more is CNBC senior contributor, radio host, and author of the new book, JFK and the Reagan Revolution, Larry Kudlow. Larry, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks for having me. L Look, I guess the big question is whether either of these candidates did what they needed to do to move the needle to draw new voters into their column. Did you see any of that last night? I didn't see much of it. I mean, I think Donald Trump may have had his best debate. He scored heavily on a lot of points, Constitution, mm -hmm. pro-life, judges, Second Amendment. He nailed Hillary on the emails and the, you know, cash favors in government and the corruption. He was very strong on that. She rebutted some of that. I give her credit. She parried it. She was able to maneuver around. But I think the biggest thing that was missing from Mr. Trump was he has a very strong pro-growth tax cut plan. And in particular, you've heard me say this, Raymond, his business tax cut, 15 percent rate for large and small companies, repatriate the overseas cash, immediate expensing for new investment. These are job creators. These are wage increasers. These are growth measures. That's the number one issue in the campaign. He got some of it out, but he didn't really make the sale. At least that's yeah. my reading of it. He's got a couple weeks to, bet, to make a better pitch, but I just don't think he did it because she's just a tax and spend liberal. That's all she's got. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to revisit some of those moments, Larry. Uh, I want to start with what has become the most controversial comment of the night, and it's this one. Chris Wallace was asking Trump if he would accept the determination and the will of the, the people and the results of this election, no matter what. Here's what he said. I will look at it at the time. I'm not looking at anything now. I'll look at it at the time. What I've seen, what I've seen is so bad. First of all, the media is so dishonest and so corrupt, and the pile-on is so amazing. I will tell you at the time. I'll keep you in suspense. Well, okay? Chris, let me respond to that, because that's horrifying. You know, every time Donald thinks things are not going in his direction, he claims whatever it is is rigged against him. Now, Larry, he's since come out 
at an Ohio event and said this. I would like to promise and pledge to all of my voters and supporters and to all of the people of the United States that I will totally accept the results of this great and historic presidential election if I win. Was that a good explain away of his original comment? And is the media making more of this than perhaps it's due? Well, I think the media is making much more of this. The media is clearly anti-Trump, and they're trying to blow this up. However, I think Mr. Trump made a mistake last night. I think it was a blunder. The way he said it, that's all I'm... You know, there are irregularities. There are issues of fraud. We've seen this in the past. He could have said, look, if we look at everything and it works out and there's no big problems, yes, of course, I will abide by the election results. Um, uh, Kellyanne Conway, his campaign manager, clarified that this morning, and I thought she did a pretty good job. But the way Mr. Trump phrased it last night, I don't think that was good. Uh, Mrs. Clinton jumped all over it, saying you're anti-democracy and things of that sort, which really aren't true. But it was a blunder, and he's paying for it. Mm. I want to go to the tax plan, Larry. Uh, here's what they had to say, particularly Hillary Clinton, critiquing Donald Trump's tax plan. Listen. I want us to raise the national minimum wage. I want to make college debt-free and for families making less than $125,000. We are going to have the wealthy pay their fair share. We're going to have corporations uh, make a contribution greater than they are now to our country. That is a plan that has been analyzed by independent experts, which said that it could produce 10 million new jobs. By contrast, Donald's plan has been uh, analyzed to uh, conclude it might lose uh, three and a half million jobs. Why? Because his whole plan is to cut taxes, to give the biggest tax breaks ever to the wealthy and to corporations, adding $20 trillion to our debt. Will it add $20 trillion to the debt? Larry Kudlow, you helped shape the Trump plan. Well, look, Mrs. Clinton's making a case from one particular model, which seems to like her plan. Um, I don't buy it. She's going to raise taxes by over a trillion dollars. It's class warfare. You tell me, if you're in a stagnant, near-recession economy, do we want a $1 trillion tax hike? Now, the Tax Foundation has a better model, if you ask me, and it scores Mr. Trump's plan to lower individual and business taxes as very pro-growth, very pro-wages, very pro-investment, very pro-capital formation. Uh, the <laughs> revenue loss, so-called, is only 2 or $3 trillion. That can be made up with spending cuts. Look, she's got a laundry list of Obama three. OK? She wants to help this group. She wants to help that group. Um, it doesn't work for me. Raising taxes doesn't work for me. Problem was, last night, Mr. Trump should have said, you know, my business tax cut for large and small companies will help the middle income wage earners the most. And that is a true fact, according to much research. He's also lowering individual mm -hmm. taxes. He's also increasing the standard deduction. In other words, sure, if you're at the upper end and you're in a progressive tax code, any tax cut is going to give you the biggest share. But they will also pay more. Trump wanted to limit deductions. He didn't get that out. You know, I'm a Reagan guy, right? So she's about four or five mm -hmm. times during the debate talking about raising taxes. If I were Mr. Trump, I would have said, oh, there she goes again, another tax hike. She's mm -hmm. taking money out of your pocket. I'm going to put money in your pocket. JFK did it successfully, the Democrat. Ronald Reagan, the Republican, did it. Even Bill Clinton cut the capital gains tax. I mean, these are things he could have mm -hmm. said to really push back and unveil uh, the hypocrisy of her program. Unfortunately, he did, he did some of it. Don't get me wrong. He got some of it out, yeah. but he didn't get the whole package out. And that's why I'm not sure the meter's mm -hmm. going to move that much. Yeah. I want, to, I want to roll this for you and for the audience. Uh, there was a discussion of open borders, noting those emails that have recently come out via WikiLeaks that have revealed the private side of Hillary Clinton. Watch.
In a speech you gave to a Brazilian bank for which you were paid $225,000, we've learned from the WikiLeaks that you said this, and I want to quote, my dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders. Is that your dream, open borders? Well, if you went on to read the rest of the sentence, I was talking about uh, energy. But you are uh, very clearly uh, quoting from WikiLeaks, and what's really important about WikiLeaks is that the Russian government has engaged in espionage against Americans. They have hacked American uh, websites, American accounts of private people, of institutions. That was a great pivot off the fact that she wants open borders. Uh -huh. Just to finish on the borders, yes. she wants open borders. People are going to pour into our country. People are going to come in from Syria. She wants 550 percent more people than Barack Obama. And he has thousands and thousands of people. They have no idea where they come from. And you see, we are going to stop radical Islamic terrorism in this country. She won't even mention the words, and neither will President Obama. Is this a return to the core issues that animated Trump's nomination at the beginning of this process? Well, I think he did a good job on that, by the way. You know, her charges about Russian hacking and whatnot, they may be true, they may mm -hmm. not be true, but that's a red herring. All that is is a distraction from what the emails actually said. And I think they were accurately quoting it. She didn't really deny it. She tried to sort of say, well, that's a bad energy. That's not what the email said. She is in favor of open borders. Look, I'm an immigration reformer, but I don't want open mm -hmm. borders, particularly during wartime. And I think Trump is right about the Syrian refugees. So I think he nailed her pretty good on that. And all this Russian stuff just clouded the issue. She was on her heels. Now, you know, in terms of Donald's original idea, you know, we've got to have legal immigration and we've got to have secure borders. And he got a chance yeah. to get back to some of those themes. I think it would help him. I think it did help him last night. Yeah. Uh, I want to play this. This is about immigration and both of their plans. Roll that. Well, first of all, she wants to give amnesty, which is a disaster and very unfair to all of the people that are waiting in line for many, many years. We need strong borders. And once the border is secured, at a later date, we'll make a determination as to the rest. But we have some bad hombres here, and we're going to get them out. I think we are both a nation of immigrants and we are a nation of laws, and that we can act accordingly. And that's why I'm introducing comprehensive immigration reform within the first 100 days with a path to citizenship. Larry Kudlow, you mentioned a moment ago, look, you're a comprehensive immigration guy. Are there areas where some in the House, particularly Paul Ryan and others, might find common cause with Hillary Clinton and find the Trump plan a bit off-putting? Well, of course, that's an ongoing discussion. I, I think Paul Ryan and the House Republicans really do want border security. And I think they really do mm -hmm. want to end sanctuary cities where these illegals uh, who are criminals uh, keep coming back into the country. Hillary doesn't address those, those issues. Those bad hombres. They're very important issues. Bad hombres, yes, of course there's some bad hombres. I mean, who are we kidding here? Some of these horror stories about Americans getting killed by illegals, you put them in jail, then you release them. I mean, all that, he was right on that. Now, there may be, down the road, room for some sort of longer-term deal. Look, Trump himself says, first, let's secure the border, and let's get rid of the mm -hmm. illegals. You know, instead of catch and release, how about catch and deport, yeah. right there at the border? I happen to favor that. So, in terms of the potential deal, we'll have to see what the election brings. But again, I, I think Mrs. Clinton is just dead wrong about open borders, and I say that as a reformer. We're in a war, Raymond. Yeah. We have to watch ourselves. Yeah. You may not be able to do it perfectly, but it's worth a try to put up barriers mm -hmm. and try to make our borders secure. That is worth a try. And on that point, Mr. Trump yeah. has actually moved me in his direction during this campaign. Hmm, interesting. Uh, there was also talk of abortion. Uh, it was really front and center, Larry, during this debate, in a way we hadn't heard it in the previous debates. And I don't think anybody can be confused at all about where these two candidates stand. Watch this. I will defend Planned Parenthood. I will defend Roe v. Wade, and I will defend women's rights to make their own health care decisions. Secretary and we have come too far 
to have that turn back now. I want to explore how far you believe the right to abortion goes. You have been quoted as saying that the fetus has no constitutional rights. You also voted against a ban on late-term partial birth abortions. Why? The kinds of cases that fall at the end of pregnancy are often the most heartbreaking, painful decisions for families to make. I have met with women who, have, toward the end of their pregnancy, get the worst news one could get, that their health is in jeopardy if they continue to carry to term. If you go with what Hillary is saying, in the ninth month, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother just prior to the birth of the baby. Now, you can say that that's okay, and Hillary can say that that's okay, but it's not okay with me. Because based on what she's saying and based on where she's going and where she's been, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month on the final day. And that's not acceptable. Larry, how do you think that resonates with faith-based voters, particularly Catholics who might be on the margins of this election? I think it was the most brilliant part of his debate. And, of course, I'm a pro-life guy. Um, the whole argument that you could actually kill a fetus uh, after nine months uh, or nine months less three days, and that her argument is this is really a woman's health issue? No, this is an issue of life and death for the fetus. And I believe only God can create a life. Only God can take away a life, not Hillary Clinton or a bunch of liberal parliamentarians. I mean, this was Trump at his absolute best. He would not let go of that, and he is completely right. He was also good in the same section. I believe it was the beginning of the debate, Raymond. He was good on mm -hmm. constitutionalist judges. He, he was very good on the Second yeah. Amendment, on uh, gun control, and uh, he was terrific on the pro-life position. Uh, I, I just thought that was Trump at his absolute finest. And on those points, he may have moved the meter somewhat, absolutely. Hmm. Hmm. No, I, I thought the, you know, the direct talk, translating it in that way for the American people, I think, does strike it hits people in a, in a very visceral way because of the construction of Donald Trump. There was no, uh, you know, gilded lily language. It was uh, right to the quick. There was another moment, Larry, and I want to share this with you. He didn't really exploit the WikiLeak treasure trove of the last few weeks. Um, and there was, but there was this back and forth. Watch this. This is a pattern, a pattern of divisiveness, of a very dark and in many ways, dangerous vision of our country, where he incites violence, where he applauds people who are pushing and pulling and punching at his rallies. That is not who America is. So sad when she talks about violence at my rallies, and she caused the violence. But it's on tape. Larry, did he make enough of that, of the uh, revelations, both in WikiLeaks and this Project Veritas uh, undercover tapes? Well, I think he put it out there, and I don't, she ha I don't think she had a very good response to it. So I think that was plus one for mm -hmm. him. The other issue that came up was this, uh, her former undersecretary of state trying to make a deal with the FBI to protect her on, uh, you know, releasing or destroying these classified uh, email tapes, the home server stuff. He, he got that in. Mm. That's pretty strong stuff. I've seen polls in the last three days where inside key states like Ohio, people really took notice of this chicanery from the WikiLeaks uh, email. So I, I think Trump got there. You know, to me, Mrs. Clinton tried to turn this into an issue about Russia. And that's just, as I said, a red mm -hmm. herring. That's just a distraction. Here are some important facts that you should know. Trump did a good job on this. She did the best she could. Yeah. I think Trump scored pretty good points. But again, Raymond, you know, mm. the number one issue, every poll, pocketbook, economy, jobs, he has yep. a good plan, if I do say so myself. He just needs to sell it. <laughs> he just needs to be more convincing. Yeah. He can do it. I know he can do it. But I think that's the task yeah. ahead for him. Well, we'll see what he does in the coming days. We'll also be watching Hillary Clinton. Larry Kudlow, thanks so much. His book, JFK and the Reagan Revolution, is available at bookstores everywhere. Thank you, Larry.
Thanks very much, Raymond. Appreciate it. Up next, we'll get story-ented with Newbery Award-winning author Avi. He'll join us to discuss his new book and the vital bonds between fathers and sons. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live and our story-ended segment. He's the author of more than 70 books and winner of the Newbery Medal. Now, you probably know him best as the author of the Crispin series, The True Confessions of Charlotte Doyle, the Poppy books, and many others. He's written dozens of different genres, from adventures to ghost stories to historical fiction. I spoke with him recently about storytelling, and one of his most recent books, about the bonds between fathers and sons. It's called The Most Important Thing, stories about sons, fathers, and grandfathers. Here's my exclusive interview with best-selling author Avi. Avi, you were born Edward Irving Wartus. Why Avi? Where did the name come from? Of course, you've known around the world now as Avi. Twin sister. For whatever reasons, makes no sense, she couldn't pronounce my name. Oh, my gosh. And called me something that sounded like Avi. Huh. I've seen it in early letters spelt in different ways, mm -hmm. and then it became what it is. And um, it became the name that anyone who would call me anything huh. calls me Avi. It's so when you published, you, you wrote Avi down. Yeah, but I didn't do the last name because my parents were very much opposed to my becoming a writer. Hmm. And that was my way of getting back at them. <laughs> Why were they opposed? Because it seems to, to, to my eye, looking at your biography, writing was really in your blood. Well, I, partly that's why. Ah. Uh, but I have what's known as dysgraphia, mm -hmm. which means I have problems writing. Hmm. And they knew that and didn't tell me huh. and didn't tell any of my teachers. So when I decided to become a writer, they were horrified. Oh, my gosh. But they wouldn't tell me why. And, you know, if you're trying to protect your child, I'm sure mm. you know this, mm -hmm. but don't tell them reason why, they're resentful. Yeah. I was resentful. Wow. And, what, and that condition creates what? You, you're Dysgraphia, confusing words? it's not like dyslexia. It's not dyslexia. No, it's not. It's more of a nuisance. Mm. It's terrible spelling, mm -hmm. common enough, yeah. letter reversals. Oh. It looks like I'm sloppy. Huh. I had an aunt who said I could spell a five-letter word wrong six ways. Hmm. So <laughs> I flunked out of high school. Oh, my God. The English teacher said I was the worst student he ever had. Oh. I required tutoring. I mean, th it was a nuisance, but I didn't know this was a problem because no one ever told me. And you were drawn to playwriting at one point. Yeah, that was smart uh -huh. <laughs> in the sense that you know what a script looks like. There's a lot of white space. Mm -hmm. That's important if you can't see the words you're writing very oh. well. And then if the character speaks in a non-grammatical way, I didn't know the grammar, but I could say that's his personality. Mm. So it was a very unconscious way of dealing with this curious phenomenon. How did that shape your later work. I mean, now you have more than 70 books. You have touched children around the globe, not only children, young people, adults. How did that playwriting detour enrich the work that you now do? First of all, I wrote bad plays. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in a few, so okay. I, it's OK. It's, OK, so, so that, that made it easy, right? And. Um, I was trying to become a playwright in New York City, and I wanted to be George Bernard Shaw, Arthur Miller. Mm. And there was no way in the world, uh, from a talent point of view, could I do that. But also, it was a time when theater was changing in New York, yeah. and they weren't interested. And I remember I wrote a play, and an agent said to me, I think I know one person in New York who would be willing to read this. And having worked on this for a year or two, I, I made that was it. I mm. can't write for one person who might. Mm -hmm. And I said, I got to shift. Mm. And then by then, I had kids of my own. 
became a more natural thing to do. So. And you became a librarian for a good long period. I of became a librarian so I could support my family. Huh. And uh, even when I was publishing books, I was a librarian. Yeah, I was a librarian for about 25 years. So. Unbelievable. How did that, I mean, you do a lot of research. I've read right. so many of your books, many of them historical fiction, but set in a world that is so accurate. I mean, Crispin, you really capture that time, that peasant well, war. Well, being a librarian, uh, I actually used to teach people how to do research. And research is really quite simple. Well, simple for you. No, it's simple for you. I could okay. teach it to you in 20 minutes. It's okay. really very easy. Okay, give Seriously. me the Reader's Digest. What is it? What, what's the missing link? Okay. How can I express this as, as simply as I can? You find the book in the broad area that you're interested in, okay. American Revolution. Okay. You go to the back of the book and go through the bibliography, oh. and you'll find hundreds of other sources, hmm. articles about things. Let's say you're interested in George Washington's home life. Mm -hmm. Well, you get a biography of Washington, and then you go to the bibliography, and there's 500 resources. Mm -hmm. they, somebody and, has done the research. Right, one of them's got to have the, the, exactly. the exact piece of That's research. That's precisely, you, you know, when I was doing Crispin, um, he's running through the forest, and I suddenly say, oh, what are the trees in medieval England like? Right. There's a book about everything, and I found this book called The Medieval Forests of England. <laughs> I mean, that's... It's, it's like a little gift from God. It is. As you find it. it. Is. Yeah. Now, tell me, you have written across so many genres, right. Bobby. I mean historical fiction. You've written uh, ch animal books. You've written ghost stories. Okay. Do, do you consider... Some authors say, look, this is my lane. I stay in it. It's what I know. Well, let's go back to our original discussion of dysgraphia. Was I was in school, and I got so much criticism that when I went to college, I took no English classes. Oh. Certainly no writing classes. I couldn't deal with the criticism. So what I did was read as widely as I could, and I would imitate the writers huh. unsuccessfully. But the point is I learned that there are different voices for different stories. Mm. I don't have a voice. I simply have a story to tell. And you rewrite that story a lot. You rewrite 70, a lot. 70 or 80 times. Each yeah. book? Yeah. Now, when you say rewrite... Hey, you're a writer. How many times? Well, I'll, <laughs> I, might, I might rewrite it maybe twice, but not the whole book. I mean, I'm, bits and pieces. When you say 70 times, you mean you rewrite the entire book? Yeah, it amounts to that. You mean in the, by, by tweaking and changing and reworking uh, and moving? Yeah, but I go through 80 drafts. Easy. It's also connected to the dysgraphia, I think. But that's uh -huh. the way that... It's that's my process. process. That's my process. What, what is... Crispin, obviously, was such an important book for you. Right. It touched so many people. What was it about that book? Obviously, the Newbery uh, Medal took, uh, took, took notice. It's a beautifully wrought book. And then you had several sequels to it. Correct. What is it about that work, do you think, that touched so many people? Well... In early modern times, the, the shift from feudal to modern times is the development of the sense of self. Mm -hmm. And that's what that story is. A kid, the original working title of that book was No Name. Oh, yeah, because he didn't know who, what his name was right. at the beginning of the book. he didn't know anything. Yeah. So it's about how he becomes a person a person that he himself understands. Mm. And that's the story of early modern times. And, but it's also, for all of us, the story of our lives. Yeah. So I think that's what... Coming into who we were meant to be. Right, and learning who we are. Yeah. So I think that's what that is. So many of your stories concern young people thrown into a crisis in an adult world that overwhelms them. They really are caught up in that moment trying to survive. Yeah. How much of that DNA runs into the life of Avi? Not much. No? <laughs> I, don't, I haven't led a terribly interesting life, I don't think. I mean, you know, there are, there are some moments we could match my experience, your experience. But, I, you know, I think it's just looking at the world and trying to understand it. Mm-hmm. The other, the other book that 
that people just love you for. I know at least in our house and, and in so many of the children I meet is the true confessions of Charlotte Doyle. Um, tell me the, what drove you to write that book? It, 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 first of all, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. You're but not I, sure? I, uh, well, I know the sequence. Mm -hmm. I had, it wasn't your first intention to write that book. It sort of fell well, out. Well, I, I wrote a book called The Man Who Was Poe, which is all about Edgar Allan Poe. And I was living in Providence, Rhode Island. And Poe, that was an important moment in Poe's life. That famous picture. Right, exactly. And if you read Poe about him, you start thinking about mysteries. Mm. And Murder on the Rue Morgue is the famous locked room mystery. First. Okay. So I'm thinking, what could be more of a locked room than a ship? in the middle of the ocean. That's the genesis. Huh. And sometimes writers get lucky. You begin a book and you discover what the book is about. And I had no intention of writing the book that it became. Wow. But I did. And uh, I wish I could have bottled it. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you and me both. When you, when you get the tonic, pass right. it on. Um, I love this idea, and I read in an interview with you, you quoted Robert Frost, who said the ear is the best reader. Correct. And you created something called Reader's Theater. Correct. I didn't I, create it. Yeah, but you, 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 you coined your own version of it. Correct. And, and I really, I, I'm sort of quite taken with it, given my background, and watching the reaction of children doing just what you're talking about. Explain to people what this is and why it's so effective. Reader's theater is which you take a text of a book, mm -hmm. not a dramatic text, mm -hmm. but a book such as you've written or I've written, and you break it down into its constituent parts, mm -hmm. characters, and you share the reading of it. That's mm -hmm. essentially it. How did I learn to do this? I was fascinated with Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens was famously a powerful reader of his work. Mm -hmm. And one day I was in the Morgan Library in New York City, and they had on display his reading copy the script. of mm -hmm. The Christmas Carol. And to my astonishment, I realized he had rewritten the book for performance. Right. That's the secret. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not literal. You cut out mm -hmm. stuff that might be boring to the reader, right. hearer, to the hearer, to the listener, right. your audience. You add stuff that you need to expand on the text to help the listener mm -hmm. follow through. And that was a revelation. Huh. And it, it's wonderful to do. It's wonderful for kids. Yeah. It's wonderful. F they don't have to memorize lines. You were in the theater. Maybe you could memorize lines. I was in Not the theater. I couldn't. Yeah, I hated it. I hated it, too. You don't have to memorize. No costumes. Huh. It's all in the voice, and the voice is surely the most wonderful musical instrument in mm -hmm. the world. No, and, it, and it's an organic, pure right. way of communication. It's how so many... Look, everything was passed on through the through oral Correct. word before the written. Yeah. I mean, I took voice lessons. I hired a director huh. to help me. How do you stand? Huh. How do you look at your audience? How do you look from the page up? Mm -hmm. They're tricks, and they are tricks. Yes, they are. And they're not hard to learn. Mm -hmm. I say if you really want to, as a parent mm -hmm. or as a teacher, really capture your kid's imagination, take voice lessons. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You learn how to... I was just reading recently how Winston Churchill, who was famously great as an orator, mm -hmm. he wrote out his scripts in a certain format so that the pauses, the dramatic pauses, right. were, built, were in. built into the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's ways to do that yeah, stuff. I agree. I want to talk about your latest book, sure. The Most Important Thing, stories about sons, fathers, and grandfathers. What made you write this book? It seems so personal when you read it. Well, I'm a son. <laughs> A father. Okay. And a grandfather. And a stepfather. Ah. So uh, these all, you know, and obviously have many friends who are fathers and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's actually not written much about. No. No, very and rarely. And yet it's so a powerful relationship. It often is a determinant for, for many kids. Well, we were so. talking earlier about the importance of fathers uh, in the green room. Tell right. me why you think fathers are so important. I think they're important because they're often absent. Mm. 
Yeah. They're not equal partners mm -hmm. in a family situation. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's problems about reading in our society. My gag is if we taught fathers to read, and particularly to read to their kids, it would be a tremendous boost to the joys of reading in our country. Mm -hmm. So it, if you're a young man, who are you modeling yourself on? Right. Your father. But if the father is absent physically or emotionally, mm -hmm. you're going to have problems. Yeah. There's a boy here. I love the story where the, the, the boy, the, his father's dead, not there. And, um, and yet the father is present. I thought that was such an interesting way to depict that relationship. He's almost like a ghost, a specter. Why that approach? Well, in the story, uh, his father has died when he's quite young. Mm -hmm. And his mother announces that she would like to remarry. This is after an interval of some years. And the boy has seen his mother make an application for a job and says, in essence, well, he's got to apply for the position. <laughs> if he wants to be my dad, he's going to apply for it and interview. And he asks for letters of interviews. He has a series of questions. And, um, you know, because I, I am a stepfather. Mm -hmm. And if you're a stepfather, you will hear, I guarantee, mm -hmm. you're not my father. I didn't pick you. I don't have to do that. Mm. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. That's the genesis of that story. Mm. So no, it's 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 a wise, I thought, very moving. Parts of it are so moving. But I've been reading this to my sons, and it's a wonderful experience to have as a father with your with your sons, daughters too, but particularly boys, I think, and fathers. It, you you will understand something about your relationship and the importance of the young people in your life and you you and theirs. Well, I was talking to a friend of mine who like you, was reading this to his two sons. And he was reading one of them in which the father doesn't come off to very well. Mm -hmm. And the father asked quite innocently, so what do you think of that? And the kid said, that's just like you, Dad. Oh, and he was, he was shocked. Wow. Well, that's the wonderful thing about fiction. It <laughs> reveals so much of who we really are. Well, but hopes. you're so wrapped in the characters and right. the plot. Sure. You, you <laughs> there's that distance. OK, I have to ask you some questions, which I ask every guest in our story-ented segment. Your favorite children's book is what? It has to be one. Yes, it has to be one. <laughs> <laughs> you can give two. I'll let you. I'll, I'll give, give you, you two, two because they're so different. Okay. When I was a young reader, the two books that had the most impression on me was a book by Kenneth Graham, The Wind in the Willows, but the other one was Treasure Island. Oh, I mean, how, my favorite. How, I love Treasure Island. But they had enormous, uh, and I still reread them mm. as an adult. They're so wonderful. Yeah, they're Extraordinary books. Beautiful books. What's your least favorite children's book? That I wrote? No, <laughs> that anyone else wrote. I don't know. I used to keep one in my desk that was so <laughs> terrible because people would come to me and say, uh, read this and tell me what you think. And I could always say, you know, I've read books that are worse, worse than yours. <laughs> I was being nice. Yeah, so, so you don't have a no. least favorite? No. OK, what was the book that you read, either as a young person or as an adult, that changed your life, reoriented your life, and gave you a life lesson that you still carry with you? And what is that lesson? Well, somehow, and I, I, I've often asked myself how, mm -hmm. I stumbled across a book called The World's Illusion. Mm -hmm by a German writer named Jacob Wasserman. You've never heard no, of him. No, I don't know the book. This was a book written in the 20s. It was an international bestseller. And it told the story about a very rich German young man who gives up everything and then eventually works with the poor. Huh. Nobody had ever heard of this book. It, 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 nobody has. I've never met anyone who's ever read no, it. No. And then. I would only learn later that this was, he took the story of Buddha, huh. who was a prince, right, and gives up his birthright, mm -hmm. and then goes out to solve the spiritual and ethnic problems of the world. I didn't realize this at the time, huh. but as a teenager, I read this book. It had a very huge impact on me. Wow. Where do you write and why? 
I work in a corner of my living room in our log house, way up 8,000 feet up in the mountains. Have you always written in corners? <laughs> I've written myself into corners. <laughs> well, I do that too. But I'm saying, do you write physically in a corner? Metaphorically, we all get there. I think I, think I do. I think I like that. The coziness in clothes. of it. No, uh -huh. it's, it's sort of focus. It's sort of enforced focus, uh -huh. I suspect. Yeah. Where do your best ideas come to you? I used to run a lot, jog, and I, I, I think I used to get wonderful ideas. Blood goes to your head. And now I just think it's just thinking. I don't mm -hmm. do as much physical exercise as I should. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's my... I should go that. I, I don't think it's slowing you down, believe me. <laughs> right. 70 plus books. You, you're, okay. I've got a lot of catching up to do. Tell me if you could pick a writing mentor, alive or dead, who would that be? That's an interesting question. Who would it be? Can I tell you a story yes. instead? As a I, way to get to the answer, you bet. I love a good story. Okay. I'm a great, I have a great fondness for the American writer Dashiell Hammett. Oh, yeah. The Maltese Falcon is one of my favorite books. I read a biography of him recently. He was a Pinkerton detective. Right. This author says that the agency required him to give detailed reports of his activities as a detective and that they should be direct, simple, and fluid. And the author of this biography says he learned this famous style from, that. from writing memos wow. to his employer, huh. which I think is a wonderful object lesson. We all hate writing memos. Right. But if you can learn to write by writing memos, why not? Look at it that way. Yeah. Look. Isn't that a nice story? So would Dashiell Hammett be your uh, writing mentor? Oh, Charles Dickens, Dashiell Charles Hammett, Dickens, yeah. Robbie Louis Stevenson. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I like, like that list. I, I like writers who write for a living mm. and not waiting for the hand of God to reach down and say, the world needs you to write this. <laughs> I think it's better when, if you want to pay a mortgage, you better get going. Get going. I, see, this, this is how I write, too. Okay. Well, you know what it is? When you're in the act, and you, as you said a moment ago, write yourself into the corner, inspiration has a much better chance of striking then than if you're just kind of waiting around for the skies to Forgive part. me. Yeah. The term inspiration. Yes. We often think of it as something coming from the heavens. Mm -hmm. It actually means to breathe life into an idea. Mm -hmm. So when I think of inspiration, what my job is, is to breathe life into the idea. Mm. And I think that's a bigger challenge than waiting for it to come from right. above. I right? agree. I agree. Okay. Uh, if you had a bit of advice to give to parents about exciting their children about reading, you would offer what tip? Always let a child choose what they want to read. Reading for pleasure is the chief way to make a lifelong reader out of anyone. Mm. Don't say, you should read this, mm -hmm. you should read this. Go into a library, help yourself. Mm -hmm. Have it's a library at home. Yeah. yeah, it's important. It's important. Final question. Um, George Martin, the writer of Game of Thrones, has a theory. There are two types of writers in the world, architects, and gardeners. Which are you? An architect or a gardener? Architect. You outline the whole thing. No, I don't at all. But that's why I, I, the structure of a book is so fundamental to what happens and how it evolves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, I think it would. Do you, how much do you outline? Nothing. Just a basic idea? Nothing at all? Not we, now. But you used to. I'll give you that. <laughs> when you were a baby like me, you did. <laughs> give me some hope here. <laughs> I would, no, I really didn't. I, I do outlines as I approach the end of the book because mm -hmm. I have to focus on what I'm right. doing. Right, and know, know the next steps. Yeah, yeah. But I, I love to be surprised huh. by what I write. Well, we've been surprised for so many years. Avi, thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. Great, delighted My to be pleasure. with you.
Avi's new book, The Most Important Thing, Stories About Sons, Fathers, and Grandfathers, is available online and at bookstores everywhere. And you can see more of my interview with Avi at storyented.com. And before we go tonight, there's a film out in theaters now that I thought you should know about. It's called Queen of Katwe. It's from Disney, and it is the story of a young Ugandan girl whose life is transformed by her discovery of the game of chess. It's a faith-filled, heartwarming story for all ages. And joining us now by phone is one of the film stars, David Oyelowo. David, thanks for being with us. The Queen of Katwe is not a typical Disney film. Tell us a little about it and what drew you to this particular project. Yeah, well, the thing that isn't typical uh, about uh, Queen of Katwe in relation to Disney is that it's a film entirely set in Africa. Um, it doesn't shy away from some of the difficulties that take place in this slum called Katwe. Uh, the film is basically about a girl called Fiona Mutesi who sells corn in Katwe and is discovered by my character, Robert Katende, um, a missionary who works with kids in, in Katwe. Uh, she's discovered to have a prodigious chess playing talent and she goes on to become a champion and even though those kind of sports movie narratives are fairly uh, classic when it comes to disney certainly the uh, the characters and the, the setting of the film is what is very unique in relation to disney now you play robert katende a missionary and a mentor to young fiona as you said what drives robert to want to help these kids who are living in poverty, when he could obviously be doing something else with his success and prosperity, and it's based on a real person. Yeah, Robert um, Katende, who I play in the film, who is obviously a real person, um, he is driven by the fact that he was an orphan himself, but had very little help uh, with the challenges he faced in life. He actually had a a phenomenal soccer playing talent as well as being uh, highly educated. He managed somehow uh, through the poverty he experienced to get educated and uh, had a successful career as an engineer ahead of him, but he chose to uh, help these kids instead because he wanted to offer to them what he hadn't been offered himself and so has chosen to stay in this slum and build his community because his belief is that if you um, instill love and uh, self-worth into these young people, they will go on to make the community a stronger place and be better citizens of society. You are very outspoken about your Christian faith. How does that faith make its way into the films you choose and your performances? I mean, do you consider this a mission for you personally? Well, you know, my faith as a Christian is, uh, is, is the cornerstone of my life, and so therefore every decision I make as an actor goes through that filter. Um, you know, I am a big believer in, in, you know, having a moral compass that dictates the kind of films I make. So I suppose to a certain degree, um, yes, my Christianity uh, definitely affects the films I do, and there's very real intersection uh, with that in Queen of Cartway and playing this missionary who helps these young kids, but also a father who really loves his wife and children and someone who has chosen the path of sacrificial love, as we know. That is the central tenet of uh, the Christian faith. So, um, yeah, I do tend to gravitate towards characters uh, whereby self-sacrifice is, is something that they value. Now, I know you're currently in rehearsals for Othello, and we've interrupted your rehearsals in New York. You're opposite Daniel Craig. Why Othello? And how has Shakespeare changed and influenced your approach to acting? Yeah, I'm actually in a rehearsal room uh, on my break talking to you now in New York, uh, where we are indeed rehearsing Othello. And um, look, there's no writer living or dead that comes close, in my opinion, to Shakespeare. Uh, I've done enough of his plays now to know that as an actor, you never fully conquer the language, you never fully conquer the play. It is some of the most challenging stuff to do, but also the most compelling storytelling, his ability to be so incisive about humanity and the human experience is second to none, really. And so, you know, doing this play for me is like going back to a acting school. It's, uh, it's, it's an opportunity for me to really drill down and become a better actor, which is what I try to do with every opportunity I'm offered. 
Well, thank you for being here. Queen of Katwe from Walt Disney Pictures, starring David Oyelowo, is in theaters now. Be sure to go see it. Well, that is all the time we have. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Now, next week, you must join us. We have a guest and an interview you will not want to miss, maybe the most consequential of the year. I'll be sitting down for an exclusive with Donald Trump, the Republican nominee for president. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Orange County. Thanks for being here. Bye now. Thank you.